Hello and welcome to Must Read Fiction, a place for people who know that life is better with a novel in hand. I'm Erin Papelka, and I'm so delighted to be here today with author Mari Coates. Welcome. Thank you, Erin. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for asking me here. It's truly my pleasure. A little bit about Mari Coates. She lives in San Francisco, where she was an arts writer and theater critic before joining the University of California Press as senior editor. She graduated from Connecticut College and holds an MFA from the Warren Wilson Program for Writers. The Pelton Papers is her first novel, and I know you have a copy of that with you. Let's see that beautiful book. Oh, so fantastic, so pretty. Thank you. So tell me about the Pelton Papers. Tell me about the book. Well, I it's it's a long story, Erin. I'll try to talk. It's, um, it comes out of a lifelong association with Agnes Pelton. Um, you can see behind me, the portrait that she painted of my grandmother back in 1921 wow. when she had just left New York City. Her mother had died and she had left in New York City for Long Island where she spent about 14 years painting portraits to support herself and searching for her own personal abstract style, which was something that was very important to her. It was kind of a, a vocation for her. Um, in so far as you think of religious figures as having a vocation, that was her vocation. It was spiritual. It wasn't religious, but she, she felt deeply and strongly that she had a window onto spiritual worlds and realities which she wanted to share with, um, with others. And so she, um, she meditated, that was part of her practice. She would get these visions and she would put them on canvas so that others, she believed as Kandinsky did, she was kind of a disciple of uh, Vasily Kandinsky, who was one of the first people to introduce the idea that art was a spiritual vehicle and looking at paintings constructed in a certain way with certain colors would lead people to an experience that was other you know that that didn't have words to it that that was not describable but that was visceral and complete and so that's what she was going for and when i found out in 96 that my grandmother's <laughs> portraitist um, also painted abstracts. It completely changed my world and I started learning about Pelton the painter, not the family friend. And that led to finally this book, which did take a long time to write. Sure, sure. Well, certainly it sounds like the origins of this book go back to your childhood. Um, but just to make sure that like readers know, so the Pelton paper, so it's a novel based on the life of Agnes Pelton. Um, right. It is fiction. It is not mm -hmm. biography. It is fiction. Excellent. That is very good to make it clear. Um, and so I'd love to hear a little bit more. So you said you grew up with these paintings. And so tell me more about how learning about Agnes Pelton inspired your writing of the book and inspired the plot and how things came together. Uh, well, I learned, I mean, I always felt drawn to her. I mean, she, she was a kind of uh, a heroic figure in our house. And, um, and yet I didn't know anything about her um, other than that she was uh, part of the small uh, Protestant sect my grandparents and great-grandparents belonged to in Brooklyn, New York called um, the Plymouth Brethren. But other than that, I had no idea about her. And when I got the catalog for the first exhibit, which was written by Michael Zakian, the curator of that exhibit, I found out so many things I couldn't quite, I just was astonished. She was part of the Armory Show, the original one in 1913, which is what introduced modern art to the United States. It's the first time the pictures were shown, pictures by Matisse, Picasso, Van Gogh, first time they were shown here and they outraged people. Isn't that fun? Sure. And she was part of that. 
she was um, she was part of. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's too. I'm trying to sum it all up. She, her family had been part of the biggest 19th century scandal really on record, which was called the Beecher Tilton scandal. Her grandmother had an affair with the famous preacher, Henry Ward Beecher, who was Harriet Beecher Stowe's brother. And there was a, a lawsuit and a trial that lasted six months Wow. And that ruined her family completely because her grandmother, who was a shy, very religious, deeply religious woman, was put on the stand in this this courtroom in New York that was scanned, you know, every day the newspapers had more about it. it lasted six months. And when she finally got up to testify, she couldn't bring herself to, to say that she had had this affair. So she uh, ruined the family that way. And Beecher was exonerated and she was uh, thrown out of his church um, and, and retreated to, to this little sect um, that did take her in. And that's how our family friendship began. But Agnes was part of this. She was also, she went to the Pratt Institute to study art where she studied with Arthur Wesley Dow, who changed the way America teaches art. He focuses on composition, and that's the name of his famous book, still in print, <laughs> thanks to the University of California Press. And um, instead of teaching artists to copy, he taught them how to construct. And um, all this is based on Japanese prints, which the Impressionists fell in love with for their structure. Um, that was important. She was uh, part of the Armory Show, as I already said. She was part of a group that, were, that set up the Armory Show. She, um, she moved to Long Island. She painted in a windmill, which we had in our home. She... Um, she then moved out to the desert in California for solitude. And that's where she stayed. And, and during those times, she had, she had three major world events, much like the coronavirus that sure. we're living through, that World War I stopped her painting. She was a very sensitive and, and shy person herself. And so it deeply upset her and stopped her painting. Then she got started again. Oh, she was. She went to Taos, New Mexico, where her friend Mabel Dodge, Luhan, whom I didn't realize was her friend, um, had a had a commune there. So she was. There were so many things to her life that were of interest, and I just thought I have to write about this woman. Fantastic. Well, I'm so glad you did. And I can feel your enthusiasm. And I can only imagine that that research process must have just been incredibly fascinating and life giving. And it sounds like you learned lots and lots of great gems. Um, and as you pointed out, though, that the Pelton Papers is a novel, it is fiction, but clearly you have done your research and this is based on a real person. So can you tell me a little bit more about how you sort of walked that balance beam between the story telling and the fiction and the fact that this was a is a real person or was a real person that you're representing in this novel well it was not it was not easy um, but it, the decision to make it a novel came pretty early because as I read Michael Zakian's book and then I was I, I was given to read um, a dissertation that a scholar in uh, Southern California kindly sent to me to read. Um, her name is Nancy Stroh Sheely, and she knows more about Pelton than anybody. But there were so many aspects to Pelton's life that were unknown and really unknowable. Her papers, the, the papers themselves, are housed by the Smithsonian Archive of American Art. Anybody can, can see them. Uh, through library shares or museum shares, but there's a lot of a lot of things that were not saved. She didn't. She never kept letters. Um, she didn't keep a lot of things. She did keep her sketchbooks and things like that, 
but but Zakian would say, you know, we don't know if she had relationships, for example. We don't know if she was attracted to men or to women. We don't know. She never said. Um, and so there was a lot of things that I wanted to explore that were essentially unknowable by me or anyone else. And so that's, it became a novel pretty quickly, but because I did want to honor her, I really did. Um, and I felt a great responsibility in that, in that department mm -hmm. to where I, I was um, kind of checking with her all the time. Is this okay? Is this okay? <laughs> And, um, and I did feel that what, I, and I do feel, I feel proud of the book and I feel that Agnes would be happy with it. And that's really important to me. So, um, I th and that's why it took so long. It really took a long time. I was at a retreat in, um, I was at Ragdale in Illinois with a month to do nothing but finish this book. Oh yeah. And I was trying really hard to, you know, I thought this is a novel. I can do whatever I want. This is fiction. And people would really love to have a really hot scene with her and some, you know. So I'm going to do that because it's a novel. I can do that. And I spent a week, one week out of my four weeks there, I spent a week trying to write this hot commercial scene. And... I simply couldn't do it. I simply couldn't. It, I just kept going, oh, that's not very good. Oh, that's, not, yeah, yeah. And so I kind of stopped and I picked up the book. I had brought all my books with me there. And I started going through Zakian's book, which is really, to my mind, the best biographical sketch we have. And I just thought, <laughs> she is so much smarter than you, me. And, 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 just don't, don't, okay? Just stay with what we know or what we think we know. And that's what I did. And so that's, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think it is a really tricky balance, right? Because you want to honor this person who has clearly had such an impact on you and an impact on your family. And even in this interview, I can feel the presence of Agnes Pelton. I mean, you know, she's there over your shoulder with that portrait that she painted. Your grandmother is here with us because she is the, the, who the portrait is of. You're here and you have engaged with this history and like brought it into your own body to sort of imagine it and then write it out through the Pelton papers. And earlier you mentioned, you know, Agnes Pelton thinking that painting felt really spiritual and it was a spiritual practice for her. And I can almost feel that same sort of respect and reverence and spirituality in the way you're talking about your writing and the work and how you tried to respect Agnes Pelton along with it. Does that it feel can, true to you? It feels true to me. And one thing I want to um, make sure I, I talk a little bit about was what happened to me when I walked into the museum at Oakland and saw her abstracts. And I have here um, a photographic reproduction of her last painting, which does figure in my book. And let me just show it to you. Yeah, oh, gorgeous. Oh, beautiful. Small reproduction of a very large painting. It's big, it's about 36 by 28 or something. I mean, it's a big picture but it is so completely different from the portraits and the landscapes that make up the work that were her day job, essentially. Sure. That's how she supported herself. These were the work of her heart. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for showing us that stunning abstract because it is, it is so different from the portrait that's there on the wall. Mm -hmm. So tell me more about what that moment was like to see those abstracts for the first time. It's almost, it's weirdly almost an out of body experience because I felt I knew her somehow. I felt I grew up with her and I did. But to walk into these gallery rooms and see painting after painting at very large with, with colors that I just, they're, they're, they're colors that really took my breath away and that was her intent because she always said color is the vehicle 
color will, is what will take you to the heart of a painting. And, and I really, I, I've, I felt almost dizzy. It's like, what, what, what? <laughs> and and I, it, was, it was quite something. And um, I've, I have been to every other exhibit of her work that I could find, including one which was down at, in Orange County. We flew down for the day just to see it because Pelton was paired with Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, you know, painting against painting for time periods. And Georgia O'Keeffe is 10 years younger and 10 years behind. O'Keeffe went to, um, studied with Arthur Wesley Dow at Columbia. Um, th there's so, there are many similarities in their backgrounds too as painters. And it was so thrilling to see these both deeply original artists next to each other, compatibly talking to each other in a way. It was really lovely and exciting. Oh, fantastic. That does sound like a truly spectacular exhibit. And I'm a little sad I didn't get to see it as well. Oh, I, I, that would have been worth flying to Orange County for. I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> yes, it. it really was. It really was. Yeah. And so for my last question, and speaking of things side by side, so um, you are also a senior editor at the University of California Press, which does only nonfiction books. And so I'm curious if you could speak a little bit to how working in nonfiction as an editor also informs your fiction writing or vice versa. Like how do those play together for you? Um, well, they play together because I think fiction done best is, is in, as, as truthful as nonfiction done best. And that fiction attempts to probe beneath what is true and, and real, at least for me. And, um, and I loved, University of California Press um, introduced me to many, many artists that I didn't know. I was fortunate enough to work on when my first job was assistant to the managing editor. And she was, she was um, managing several, of our art books, which did, um, which we, we did out of house mostly. And most of them were art catalogs. And I, I got to know many, many artists. And, um, and we had a very wonderful art list at the time. So that just, I just felt myself expand to include all that. And it was, it was deeply compatible for me. And the standards at University of California Press were my own standards, and um, I have taken them with me. <laughs> and uh, so it was my honor and my great joy to work for them for over 15 years, and I am grateful for that time, and I am very grateful to have, to have this. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and to be talking to you. So I think, um, does that cover that for you? Yeah, no, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. I think you, your, your opening statement about that is resonates really beautifully for me that both nonfiction and fiction are telling the truth through their own vehicles. And I feel like what's beautiful about fiction is, is it does get to the truth, but sometimes we have to get to the truth through characters that we've imagined and characters that we've invented and putting them in places where Maybe we haven't been ourselves, but through the experience of the characters, that could be our experience too, and therefore it becomes the truth. Right. So I think that that's incredibly beautiful. Um, Good thing I just want to add, I can't really make up things. I mean, I spent a week in Ragdale trying to make up. I, can't, I don't do it. What I often do is look at a photograph. It can be of anyone, and try to imagine who that really is inside. So that's... Uh, that's the way I deal with fiction. Beautiful. Yeah, and that's the nature of historical fiction. And so that's that's so great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mari Coates, for taking the time to like really imagine the life of Agnes Pelton, to give it to us in the Pelton papers, to share that gorgeous portrait of your grandmother, um, and to spend the time talking with me today. This was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Erin.